Mr. Chairman. Fellow delegates and friends, I have appreciated very much the debate this morning, and uh, when I heard references to tours de force, and I heard references to personalities, I thought it interesting if I just glanced on the file and see whether since I've been Foreign Secretary I've ever indulged in it. In the rest of Europe, there are certain states which think like we do. And surely there can be no objection to coalescing with those states, harmonizing our economic policy, harmonizing our defense policy, and if it's said it is to contain Russia, well, the Russian frontier is over nearly 300 miles away, and therefore, uh, what are we containing? And if there's no intention of aggression, then surely the rationalizing of the cost of defense, the rationalizing of our economy, the planning of economy in Western Europe on social democratic lines is, after all, in my view, a correct policy. Now, uh, Mr. Ziliakis referred to what, and that is largely in the hands of Russia to stop, which I'll explain. We should have a lot of provocations to put up with. I don't think they're doing any good to peace. I think it will help to start discussions if it ceases. And I would suggest those who started it might set an example and stop it. And that would have a great influence, much more than answering candidates or giving replies to correspondents, because on that point, uh, one speaker said that I objected to propaganda. Not at all. I think if a movement has ideas, it's right to propagate, uh, propagate them. I have no objection at all, and never have. What I don't think is right and what I think will never bring peace is when the usages, the ordinary usages related, uh, between friendly states is uh, treated in a roughshod manner and uh, is forgotten and other methods are adopted. That you would have been on this platform today telling this conference as uh, I believe the Mr. Morrison did the other day, you would have to cut the rations and cut the, f the standard of living in this country. We decided to carry on. And I want to say for our team in that work, they've done a great job. But then there was the next stage. We knew, and we do know, and have realized that ever since we've been in office, that aid of this character is not enough, and that standing singly as representing 47 million in this country, we could not see our way through alone. Now, in Western Europe, there is a great industrial area, highly skilled people, and over the world, <coughs> there is a substandard of living by, for millions of people. And the question is, how can you plan the economy of the West to help develop the standards in Africa, Southeast Asia, and all the other great undeveloped countries? Well, I've taken the view, rightly I think, that there is two possibilities. If we limit ourselves to the Commonwealth alone, it will not be sufficient. If we harness the Commonwealth and the overseas territories, which we are jointly responsible for, to the skill, the ability, and productive capacity of the West, then we can solve our balance of payments and they can have a continuing rising standard of living for generations to come. Now that's British foreign policy. Phase. Outside 
of Europe, and I'll come back to Germany in a moment, outside of Europe, there is the vexed problem of Japan. That if only it stops, the money the Greek government has now to spend in trying to crush a civil war will be turned on to reconstruction and in helping the Greek people to get on their feet again. Immediately it can be done. In the meantime, I give the conference the pledge that in the case of the uh, 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 shootings, we'll do all we can to try and urge upon the Greek government and the Greek people uh, patience and endeavor to try and pacify where they can rather than destroy. I'm quite willing to accept the executive's resolution as expression of what we are trying to do, which I believe have been circulated this morning. That is our policy, and I ask for your unanimous support. <laughs> in all to pass bills for the nationalization of certain industries. We have not neglected any part of the field. We have a great instalment of nationalization measures. In the period under review, we've carried the nationalization of transport and of electricity and the gas bill is now slowly on its way, having got through committee and now coming to report. <coughs> there are other very important economic matters, reorganization of industry matters, such as the Agricultural Act. And there's a great group of social service and local government legislation. Perhaps the most outstanding of those is the National Health Act. And then there are reforms long overdue which we have had to take up owing to the neglect of past governments. There's the Companies Act, the Crown Proceedings Act, and the Bill, the Criminal Justice Bill, which is now going through. Then there are measures. Of course, great publicity is given to any signs of dissension and disagreement. Well, there are healthy divergences of view. There are sometimes divergences that go beyond uh, what is healthy. We've had to exclude uh, some members. But I should like to stress the great loyalty of the vast majority of the party and their steady service. They may not convince me that they are right, but I believe that the foundation of democratic liberty is a willingness to believe that other people may perhaps be wiser than oneself. I'd like to say here that we owe a great debt of gratitude to Maurice Webb and Frank Bowles. Maurice Webb has been suffering under very severe uh, physical uh, journey to freedom. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and fellow delegates, I move uh, the adoption of the parliamentary report. Uh, this records the activities and the legislation the third year of a great parliament, the third year of a Labour government with power. You have before you a description. And I appeal to those the, uh, to, who've been engaged in it to cease it. Under the somewhat intermittent, intermittent uh, leadership of Mr. Churchill, 
Sometimes the opposition appears to demand the abolition of all controls. But another time they'll get up and ask for more controls in special matters which interest a particular members. disabilities. He's carried out his duties with a very fine sense of devotion. We all hope that his health will improve. What are government's achievements in the face of great difficulties? Sometimes they denounce the control of industry by the bureaucracy of the civil service, the dead hand of parliament. And yet when, with their approval, we entrust nationalized industries to independent boards, they demand that all those activities be brought under...